required for funding and they voted to restore it to full funding. Which is even start didn't get completely restored, but they took a you know, like a I don't know, they were Yes, we might as well begin. So that was good. And, the, uh, and this program still has to go through is, about is, six uh, other steps, uh, but they're very unlikely. Dedicated to Auburn County. And I'd like to uh, first of all point out we have a uh, special uh, display which Dan Nixon and Randy have worked on hard, and uh, this will be used mm -hmm. on Saturday at the uh, Auburn County uh, celebration in Paris, Paris Hill in the uh, uh, Caddy building where uh, historic societies will be gathered and we'll have some materials about the society and all kinds of brochures of the Bannigan project, etc., etc. So I'd like to thank uh, Dan and Randy for doing all that good work there. So, and uh, uh, Dan did, did the, uh, more of the design. Randy uh, looked, oversaw everything, make sure it was all right. As you, as you all know, he's pretty particular about everything, as, well, as Dan is too. So. Uh, let's go uh, on to the program introducing Larry Glass. Larry Glass is a graduate of Bridgeton High School. He earned an AB degree from Dartmouth College and an MAT from Harvard. He has taught secondary school English and theater in both public and private schools in Maine, New Hampshire, and New York. He has served as president of the Education, Speech, and Theater Association of Maine as a board member of the Maine Association of Teachers of English. More recently, he directed the Management Information Services Department at Stevens Memorial Hospital in Norway and he presently manages information services for a national health care rights organization. As a result of his abiding interest in local and regional history, Mr. Glatz has been involved in a number of related organizations and activities, a member of numerous historical societies, and has spoken on a variety of subjects related to local history. In 1994, he organized a celebration and seminar focusing upon the life and works of Norway, Maine writer Charles Asbury Stevens, 1844-1931. Since then, he has edited and acquitted the four new works relating to C.A. Stevens and his circle. And he's currently working on a compilation of the remembrances of, of St Stevens' cousin, Addison Barrow, uh, 1839 to 1929, of Greenwood, Maine, one of America's most eminently, eminent early zoologists and taxonomists. His article on life and times of the Oxford Bears will be appearing in the next issue of Maine History, the quarterly publication of the Maine Historical Society. His joint attention, attraction to, to matters both digital and historical have led him to a hobby of computerizing the records of the Maine's 1850 federal census, the earliest to include the names, ages, and birthplaces of every resident of the state. He is the chairman of the Oxford County Bicentennial Committee, and, uh, and through his efforts, uh, he has organized what's going to be a memorable time on uh, Saturday, and, and actually Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, all three days. So. Without further ado, Larry Glatz. Uh, thank you, Stan. And uh, very happy to be here this evening. Uh, you know the rain, <laughs> the brief rain, although I could go wet somehow. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to be able to talk on this subject because this is the uh, very first, although I've been working on this subject for about four or five years now. Uh, this is actually the first time I've had a chance to talk to a group of people about it. Uh, so it's interesting for me. I hope it'll be interesting for you. Uh, the Oxford Bears, uh, you may have heard about recently. Uh, and if you have, it's probably as a result of uh, the various activities connected to the Bicentennial. Because we've tried hard during the Bicentennial to revive the bear image in, the, in its association with Oxford County. If you look at the display in the back cabinet there, you'll, you can see a lot of bears. I can see them from here. Uh, and up on the table after the meeting, if you have a chance to look, we've got lots of other bear images for you to see too. But the Oxford Bears have been a, a fascinating project for me. Uh, in a way, it's like uh, 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 working on the Ivory Bill Woodpecker project. You know, the folks looking for the Ivory Bill Woodpecker, they thought it had disappeared, and they looked all over for it, and they, they finally this year found the an actual Ivory Bill Woodpecker, and it was big news all over the world. Uh, in a way, the Oxford Bears have been even more of an interesting exploration for me because uh, nobody knew the Oxford Bears were out there. The Oxford Bears had totally disappeared. Uh, it would be as if someone came back from Louisiana saying they had found this huge ivory-billed woodpecker that nobody had ever seen before at all. That would be astonishing. And uh, actually, in a way, the, the Oxford Bear is that kind of creature. 
because uh, the, uh, the Oxford Bear as a county image has entirely disappeared uh, from the county at the time that I stumbled into the, the fact that, that he had once existed. Uh, uh, as an example of that, I can tell you that when I first started asking people about the Oxford Bear, have you ever heard of the Oxford Bear? Uh, you know, asking people who have been in Oxford County for a long time, whose ancestors have been here, and even people who have studied the history of the county, I asked uh, almost all the people you would expect would know something about the Oxford Bear, and almost all of them said, well, there's a fire truck down in Norway. It's a hand pump thing, which is called the Oxford Bear. Uh, so that's probably what you're talking about. I know we made some progress because just two or three days ago I got in touch with a fellow who is in charge of that fire device. We were trying to get it up on the hill for the, the celebration this weekend. Uh, and I was talking to him about it on the phone and I said, uh, you know, we'd like to get the, that particular. He said, why don't you get the Paris one up there because it's closer and it's also not, you know, it's a similar vintage. It's an old fire truck, you know, it's an old hand pump thing. Uh, so that'll be just a good one. And I said, no, no, it really won't because the Oxford Bear hand pumper has, a, has an Oxford bear on it, and it's got that image, which has been with the county for so long. And he said, uh, he said to me, uh, yeah, that was a political group from a long time ago. Uh, that's how it got its name. Um, so I was kind of pleased with that. Uh, it's taken two or three years, but uh, at least now some people in the county who are uh, associated with the Oxford bear image at least understand that it's more than a fire truck, uh, which is good. So I think that's progress. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how I stumbled into the Oxford bear just to refresh my own memory, and, and because it was uh, a curiosity, it was, it was fun. Uh, uh, as uh, Stan said in his introduction, I had previously been working on quite a number of projects associated with C.A. Stevens, the writer from Norway, who wrote all those stories, children's stories for the Youth Companion, and stories about life on the old farm, and uh, the, the boys' and the girls' adventures up in the great woods, which turned out to be, if you do your geography right, right about where we're sitting right now, was, I think in Stevens' mind, were the great woods. <laughs> uh, and in conjunction with that, I was trying to just get a feel for local history of the time, and I was reading through Norway in the 40s, which is that wonderful collection of newspaper uh, articles by Osgood Bradbury, uh, which were republished by, uh, by the Norway Historical Society not long ago. It's a big, thick blue book. Uh, and originally when it came out, it had no index, and that's why when I was reading it, it had no index, so I was forced to read every single page to find any, any references to C.A. Stevens and the people I was looking for. And on one page, I found a reference to, a, to a, an address given at the Norway Pine Grove Cemetery one afternoon, uh, one weekend afternoon in the summertime, by, as Osgood Bradbury described him, by J.J. Perry, that specimen bear of the Oxfords. And bear was capitalized, the specimen bear of the Oxfords. I, I had no idea what that reference was. Uh, Reading a few articles further on, I came to another couple of references about people who were bears uh, in the Oxfords. And then I, I found another reference uh, quite a lot further on to a, to a meeting of the bears recently held in Norway, it said. Uh, now at the same time uh, that I was reading Norway in the 40s, I was trying to find out something about the 14th Maine Regiment because C.A. Stevens had written a, a very interesting book about uh, serialized book about uh, the 14th Maine Regiment called Guess, which no one on the planet has ever heard of or read these days, but it's, it's quite an interesting early work of C.A. Stevens's. And uh, I was trying to find out something about the 14th Maine, because it's a story about, about a fellow, a drummer boy in the 14th Maine. Uh, so I was going out of the library to read various Civil War things having to do with Maine regiments, and you may be aware of that uh, book entitled, I think it's The Rebel Cry and the, Yan the, the Yankee Hurrah and the Rebel Yell, something along that line. Uh, which is a journal of a you know, young man who was in the 17th Maine. Uh, and on the first few pages of the book, it says, uh, he's writing uh, his reminiscences of forming the, the regiment, and he says, the 17th Maine was formed mostly of boys from uh, Sanford and Saco, Sanford, Saco, and Biddeford, with a few Oxford bears thrown in. Now, that was really interesting. At, at that point, when I read that sentence, I, I, at the same time, I've been reading, say, Norway in the 40s and a couple other bear references. I simply made a note of and, and you know, for future reference. But when I read that quotation, I thought there had to be something going on. That a, that a Civil War soldier, private from Sako, uh, would be familiar enough with something going on in society to know that he was from York County, but there were these other people who were Oxford bears. Um, 
So I went back to Norway in the 40s and I tried to look up that uh, a citation having to do with the meeting of the bears lately in Norway, uh, which turned out to be, if I remember correctly, it was 1885 or six perhaps, 1887. Uh, one of the newspaper articles late in 1887, Bradbury says, a meeting of the bears held lately in Norway. Uh, so with that, I, I read the microfilm issues of the advertiser, <coughs> excuse me, the Democrat. Uh, if anybody has the advertiser for those years, please let me know. Uh, I was reading the uh, microfilm for the Democrat, and, and sure enough, there was an, an article about the meeting of the Oxford Bears Association from Portland, who had recently come up on a train. Uh, as a matter of fact, there had been two trains full of Oxford Bears, over 300 in all, and, and all of Chandler's band came along with them. Uh, there was a huge celebration in Norway uh, on that afternoon. Uh, they were met at the railway station in Paris by uh, people with wagons who paraded them around Norway. They had a grand feast at Beale's Hotel. Uh, Frank Bartlett trotted out his stuffed Oxford bear. Uh, all of the Oxford bears wore their badges, and grand time was had, uh, speeches, toasts, so on and so forth. It was a wonderful time. Uh, so that was the beginning of my exploration of the Oxford bears. Who were they and where did they come from? Uh, one thing led to another, and now it's, uh, it's I'd say, three or four years later. And I, I think I have a a fairly complete picture of the life and time of the Oxford Bears, but there are still many things that are unknown, and there's still many, many things to be found out. Uh, I, I really think that if uh, somebody could find me those copies of the Advertiser, which generally speaking had a lot better local coverage than the Democrat did, uh, we, we'd learn some more about it. And at the end of my talk, I'll give you some clues of things you can look for when you're rummaging through your attic, because I know they're out there, and I'd love just to see them. Uh, but back to the beginning. <laughs> So now we know, or at least at that point, I knew that the Oxford Bears was an association of people. At that time in the 1880s, it was families, uh, men, women, children, so on. Um, some of them old timers, some of them uh, you know, relatively newcomers. Uh, it was a great social organization, uh, and apparently it was well enough known so that it was written about in that paper, and I found articles about it in the Portland paper, and even the Bangor papers about the, these great meetings of the Oxford Bears. Uh, but that's still 20 years later than the, than the Civil War reference to the Oxford Bears. So obviously the Oxford Bears were flourishing in the 1880s, but they were fairly well known in the 1860s. So the obvious question is, if you follow the line back, how far back do you have to go to find the first Oxford Bear? Uh, in a way, that's still a question. I, I think I can come close to the period of time that the expression developed and began to spread through the county and then through the state. Uh, but the smoking gun is still missing. There's still that first reference to the, the, the earliest reference to the Oxford Bear. It's out there in somebody's uh, journal or a letter to somebody to somebody else uh, or a newspaper article and the newspaper is missing and so on. Uh, but let me tell you what I've, what I've learned so far. Um, <clears throat> Arabella Rawson Carter, I believe her name was, lived on Paris Hill for quite some time, was married to Congressman uh, Carter. Uh, claims in a letter, which is in the possession of the Paris Hill Historical Society, that all this noise about the Oxford Bears, she was writing in the 1880s, and there had been a series of articles about the Oxford Bears. She said, all this noise about the Oxford Bears is really missing the point. She said, I well remember back in 1825 when Adams and Jefferson had died and Governor Lincoln came to Paris Hill to, to deliver a, a, a joint commemorative address. Uh, for the, the presidents who had recently died, that people along Main Street said, look at all those Oxford Bears going by uh, to hear Governor Lincoln speak. Now, I haven't found any reference earlier than about 1836 or seven, and she's saying that 10 years before that, people in Oxford were generally known as Oxford Bears. Uh, that's what I'd like you to find for me, if you could, as you're looking through your journals and so on. I'd like to find that reference to the Oxford Bears, where to a newspaper article about, about Governor Lincoln's address in which it might talk about the Oxford Bears or something. I haven't been able to push it back that far, and I don't want to disagree with uh, Mrs. Carter, because she was an esteemed uh, and probably knowledgeable person. However, she was in her later years, and she was also writing a very nasty letter at that time, although the tone of the letter is uh, quite terse, uh, and it could very well be that she was simply uh, responding to the fact that all these people were having so much fun, she was being left out, and she wanted to have a car that they didn't have. It's very hard to say. Uh, I have, but I haven't found a reference that old. And I have found references to some uh, people, I'll mention one tonight in particular, 
uh, who claim that they are the they they in fact were the originators of the term, uh, but they weren't. Uh, so back in uh, in the 1830s, in the early 1830s, when uh, Oxford County was uh, just a few years old, and when county government in Maine meant something, uh, and I don't want to say that it doesn't mean anything today, but if you're familiar with the history of this county and the other Maine counties and counties in New England and outside New England, uh, all you have to do really is get west of the Hudson, and you realize what counties really used to be here in New England. That is. Uh, in, if, you, if you are west of the Hudson or south of, practically south of the, uh, what, uh, the same river, anywhere outside New England almost, uh, the school systems are all county-wide school systems. The historical societies are virtually all county historical societies. Uh, the political machinery is virtually all county, county run. Uh, the local officials and if there are local schools or if there are local historical societies, they're clearly inferior to the county. The county is operating the show. Uh, and in, in counties uh, in the far west, in the deep south, uh, the counties really control absolutely everything. The towns, the towns have virtually no power at all. Virtually all power rests with the county. Now, once upon a time in New England, that was the case, but it's not that way anymore. Uh, Connecticut abandoned its counties in the 1960s. They no longer have county government at all. Uh, they have 162 towns with 162 probate offices and 162 land records offices, if you can imagine that. Uh, it's, it's quite frightening to me. Uh, Massachusetts has been scaling back its counties. It had 14 up until, I think, the 80s, and then they started consolidating counties. So I think they're down to eight now, and the plan for Massachusetts is that they'll eventually consolidate them down even further. There's occasional talk in Maine of eliminating counties or uh, limiting what counties do or, or uh, moving some of the functions of the county to some other level. Uh, it could well be that uh, on the tricentennial of Oxford County, there won't be an Oxford County to have a tricentennial of. Hard to say. But counties in Maine, counties in New England, are nowhere near as important as they are in the rest of the country. But once upon a time, they were. In uh, Maine, between uh, uh, really, actually, from this from this late 1700s up until the Civil War, past the Civil War, the the real authority in the state rested at the county level for many many political uh, social uh, uh, functions. The judicial districts and legislative districts and the national districts for representatives and so on were parceled out by county. And in Massachusetts, it was quite common in Maine too, early in the in the uh, history of the state, when a new county was formed, a new Senate seat was formed for the, for the person from that county who was going to be the senator from that county. Uh, as a matter of fact, when Oxford County was formed, one of, the, one of the prime people pushing for the formation of the county was Levi Hubbard in, of Paris, who was a state representative at the time, representing his district. Uh, and after he pushed for a year or so to get a new county formed, it's not surprising that the new senator from the brand new Oxford County turned out to be Levi Howard himself. Uh, the militia was divided on the county level. Each county had its own division with its own generals and, and staff and so on, its own artillery. Uh, and when, the, when maneuvers were held, they were held uh, locally at some times of the year and then countywide. Uh, the generals at the county level, if you look through the officer corps of the militia, it very closely paralleled the political structure. So that the general of the county militia uh, not surprisingly, was very often also the representative in Congress, or perhaps the senator, or perhaps a gubernatorial candidate, and so on down the line. When you get down to the captains and so on, these were the people who were the selectmen and the local judges and so on and so forth. It was really quite, uh, quite a cohesive, uh, easy to figure out uh, political and social structure that really gave the county a tremendous amount of authority. So when votes were counted, they were counted by the county. And the way the counties would move one way or the other often, often affected who would be governor. Because in Maine, the governor's race had to be decided in those days by a majority, an absolute majority. And very seldom could they garner an absolute majority. These races would be thrown to the legislature. And the people who then held the power were these people who were elected at the county level. It was the county political parties who had the authority to do the appointing. It was the uh, county that parceled out uh, the postmasterships and so on and so forth from Washington. Uh, the county had uh, a, a kind of authority and power that is hard to imagine today. And out of that, out of that kind of structure uh, 
came the, the sort of social notion of what the county was that gave the county, or at least gave the county the opportunity of having an identity as a county. So if you read the papers for those days, you'll find, particularly during election time, that uh, you know, rather than uh, you know, go Bush or go Cheney or go somebody else, uh, there are these expressions like, uh, you know, uh, little Waldo will prevail, or let's hear it for old Cumberland, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so the counties, the counties uh, that our ancestors lived in uh, were were strong and cohesive units. Uh, in in 1834, uh, at a political convention over in Buckfield, uh, where they always did toasts and so on and so forth, is one of the toasts was to the county of Oxford, her sons who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God and will show themselves as ready to oppose the encroachment of corrupt money power as they have been to defend their country against the invasions of a foreign foe. Well, of course, the corrupt money power were the Federalists or the Whigs at that time. Uh, and the sons of Oxford who labor in the earth, of course, were the Jeffersonian Democrats, uh, Jack Jefferson Jackson Democrats. Uh, and this toast, toast to the county, was really a political statement, which is, we in Oxford are different from those people down in the southern part of the state. We work hard. Those people are, uh, to, to uh, quote uh, a noted political leader of our recent past, the feet and impudent snobs. Why not? Uh, Bethel, his quote, here's a, another toast from Bethel. Kings, emperors, titles, nobility, and traitors, even if under the name of Whig, may they be as scarce in America as snakes are in Ireland. You know, drive out the Whigs. We don't need them here in our fine county. Uh, in 1834, uh, when Jackson uh, finally uh, left the presidency, uh, the Whigs were very happy indeed because Jackson proved to be a, just a phenomenal vote getter during his day and he pulled a uh, tremendous vote here in Maine. Maine at least uh, once you got off the coast, Maine was virtually 100% uh, Jacksonian country. Uh, the Boston Courier, upon the retirement of Jackson in 1834, uh, had a little editorial entitled The Tennessee Farmer. Uh, and this, uh, this article shows up in many of the Jackson biographies and uh, works of other political figures at the time to give you a feel for the, the strong feelings of the parties uh, against the, the Whig Party, any rate, against Jackson. The Tennessee farmer says, General Jackson has gone to his hermitage, and if he would let his beard grow and shave off some of his prejudices and rancors, a very pretty hermit he would make. May our Cincinnatus find in retirement the peace that was denied him while a dictator. May he turn better furrows in Tennessee than he has cut, cut swaths in Washington. May his hand be more familiar with the plow than with the scepter. That is, in, in short, he's a farmer, let him farm, say the Whigs. There were quite a few uh, Democratic responses to that. They thought that was a very nasty thing to say about the recently retired president. Um, and the newspaper, the Boston Courier, a couple of weeks later, published what they called a clarification. They said, uh, in, an, in an editorial entitled Country Matters. They said, some editors copy our words with commendations. Others visit them with censure. But we were, not, we were born in the bush, and we have therefore neither fear nor reverence for owls. One, an owl, not an editor, suggests that we undertake the mental, that we underrate the mental capacities of the furrow turners, that is Democrats, because we praise their bodily prowess and refer us their feats of legislation as proof of their sagacity. But it is a ticklish business to make laws. It is a trade or science, the complex of all trades and sciences. A legislator cannot have too much knowledge. He must know the past and the present, and in foreign countries as well. A farmer never looks so well as when he has his hand upon the plow. With his huge paw upon the statutes, what can he do, said the Boston paper. Now that phrase, that huge paw phrase, just set the Democrats off into a frazzle of anger. Uh, all over New England, uh, and probably all over the United States, if you had the time or <laughs> inclination to dig out the old newspapers and read them. But uh, when I went down to the American Antiquarian Society to look through newspapers from the 1830s, uh, virtually every single Democratic newspaper of the day had had a virulent, angry responses to this huge paw notion. 
And you can find in capital letters in all these editorials, huge paws. They didn't like the, they didn't like the notion that their hands were fit only for the, for the plow and not for the pen. Uh, now, huge paws is an important part of this Oxford bear story because we all know that bears have huge paws, and huge paws will come into this a little later on. But from the first use of that huge, pro that huge paw insult by the Boston paper, huge paw became a term all throughout New England, at least, uh, of pride, really, of the Democrats. They talked in the next election after this. I mean, they, they really got angry here in Maine, and I think it's, it's one of those situations where the Whigs, had they just left the first editorial alone, they, they may have been a lot better off. But by writing the second editorial and causing the anger that they did, they caused a lot of people to want to go out and, rate, and get a lot of votes uh, cast, and the Democrats did just that. They really piled up pretty large majorities in the next election, and then all the Democratic newspapers, of course, had these headlines to say, Huge paw swats down, uh, you know, wig, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and whenever a, a local wig would uh, claim that he's going to win this office or win that office, the Democratic newspaper would reply, the huge paw will smite you again as it smote you last time, and so on. So the huge paw expression uh, really had uh, currency uh, and, and life and legs. It, it, uh, it was. Uh, I found it repeated in the papers for almost 10 years uh, in the various New England newspapers, this huge paw notion. Um, here's, uh, this is from uh, later on the same year, toward the end of that year, uh, from the, uh, Ox this is the Oxford paper quoting the Bangor Republican. You remember in those days, Republican, just Republican slash Democrat, it was the same party, where the Whigs, the Federalists, Whigs and Federalists over here. Uh, Democrat, Republic, Democrat slash Republicans over here. So the Belfast paper, which is called the Republican today, the third oldest paper in the state, I think, that was originally a Jacksonian paper which called itself the Republican because it was Republican Democrat. And today it is a Republican newspaper. Now the Oxford Democrat called itself the Democrat because it was from the same part, the very same party, the Republican Democrat, but the Oxford Democrat chose to use the other half of the, the phrase rather than the Republican half. And the Oxford Democrat, since the Civil War, has been a Republican paper. So go figure. It's one of those things. At any rate, from the from the Oxford, uh, we don't have enough time for all those digressions. Uh, from the Oxford uh, Democrat, uh, quoting from the uh, Bangor Republican, resolved that the principles and policy of Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson are, as our correspondents represent them, identical that the gag law and the Sedition Act, which characterized the federal party in the days of the former, find their parallel in the mobs, riots, figurehead outrage under the administration of the latter, and will be put down by the huge paws of laborers and furrow turners. And these, I'm reading these loud because the headlines all of a sudden get this big, and they say, huge paws of laborers and furrow turners whom the Federalists affect and despise. Uh, this sort of thing goes back and forth all the time, and those of us, or you, or anyone, who think that today's newspapers are evil because they take sides and they're partisan and they're not neutral and they don't try to present both sides, should turn back the pages a couple of hundred years ago and see what real, real uh, muscular newspaper writing was. And in a way, actually, it might be better, frankly, to get back to that sort of thing. Uh, in one of the C.A. Stevens stories, the old squire is said to have subscribed to two newspapers always, because you can never get the story from one. You need to have them both, to, because they're constantly battling with each other. And Norway Paris is a wonderful example of that. That's another reason why I want the advertiser, uh, because it opposed the Democrat on almost all issues. Uh, in any event, uh, one of the uh, Whig newspapers up in Augusta, which I think was simply a uh, a political paper put out for a few years, uh, uh, is very upset at the fact that the Democrats keep winning, particularly in the back counties, uh, such as Oxford, and says, uh, the, uh, the paper says, the state of Maine is a paltry wilderness. Her people are a set of paupers, squatters, and swindlers, totally unworthy of credit. Her rivers mere brooks, her ships unseaworthy, her mines, her timberlands, which some insane people have talked about as having real value. I have to stop here and say, this is a Boston paper. This is the Boston Atlas, a Whig paper. Uh, but this is being quoted in the, in the uh, Augusta paper. Her mines, her timberlands, with some insane people to have talked about as having real value, moonshine, existing only in the imagination of visionaries, her soil too sterile to avoid pasture for sheep, a miserable re region of mental obliquity. 
Uh, now, then the Canavec Journal, printing that same article, went on to say, uh, we have not so good an account to give our readers of the results of the election as they had hoped before them. That is, they're, they're telling their own readers that they really didn't do well the last time around. The county of Kennebec has somewhat increased her Whig majority, but the local focos have swelled their votes very much in the benighted regions of Oxford and Waldo, where it would seem as if scarcely a ray of light has been permitted to penetrate. <laughs> the Eastern Argus in Portland, then, which is a Democratic newspaper, so you really can't tell what's going on here unless you know the political leanings of the various newspapers. It doesn't take long to figure them out, though. The Eastern Argus, which at this time uh, was edited by, uh, by John M. Uh, Adams from uh, Rumford, a uh, long, long time editor of the Eastern Argus, ardent Democrat all of his life, uh, even through the Civil War and even after, writes in the Eastern Argus, Federal insults to the people, destitute of principle themselves, they, the Whigs, cannot conceive it possible for others to be actuated by honest motives. Hence, they sneeringly rail at the people as the blind bears of the back towns, as the nose-led ignoramuses, bribed at the dram shops and led to the polls by drill sergeants, as men who are willingly gagged, cheated, and humbugged. Uh, and this is, this is uh, middle 1839. And then in August of 1839, in the Oxford Democrat, uh, the Oxford Democrat for the first time connects all three of these images together and talks about the people in Oxford County, the huge pause in the benighted region of Oxford County, uh, the bears of the backwoods, they say, are going to strike back at these Whigs. Uh, and then in 1840, so this in 18, August 1839, is the first reference to Bears, Oxford County, Huge Paws, and so on, in the same place, in the same paragraph, in the same paper. That's the earliest reference I found to, to Bears, Backwoods Bears, Oxford County, Huge Paws, the Night of Region, and so on, all in the same place. So it seems to me, at least by August of 1839, Oxford and Bears are perhaps so close that they are connected. In 1840, February of 1840, uh, several months later, J.J. Perry, John Josiah Perry of Oxford, uh, who gained political prominence by writing lengthy editorials in the paper uh, har harassing the state government for the, for the uh, organization of the militia, it was terrible. People were called out at the wrong time of the year. They weren't paid enough. They weren't paid for their equipment and so on. This is really an awful thing. Uh, he wrote several very lengthy articles, and as a result, was promptly elected to the legislature because the local yeomen loved to get that sort of they didn't like to have to go out and do drilling around and not get paid for it, have to supply their own equipment, and so on and so forth. So they elected Perry to Congress, and uh, I haven't found exactly when yet. Uh, I gave the task to Herb Adams, who let me down on this one. J.J. Uh, uh, Perry managed to get himself not only named a general in the militia himself, uh, when it served his purposes, but also elected to Congress and to the Governor's Council, and so on and so forth. But at any rate, J.J. Perry, in February of 1840, in a very uh, nasty argument in the state legislature, having to do with whether or not there should or should not be a bounty on bears. Uh, and to tell you the truth, I've read a dozen articles on what the dispute was about. I know it was whether or not there should or shouldn't be a, a bounty on bears, but for the life of me, I haven't been able to figure out who was for, who was for and who was against it. I don't know. But at any rate, J.J. Uh, Perry was in the midst of the argument and one of the legislators from Washington County stood up in the legislature, and this was reported in papers all over the state, uh, said, if the legislature doesn't repeal this law, someone will soon be bringing here the scalp of this old Oxford bear himself for a bounty. So by February 10th, 1840, the notion of Oxford bear was known well enough around the state, and this is only a few months after the article in the, in the Democrat, that somebody from Washington County would be able to point at somebody from Oxford County and say, you are an Oxford bear, which is exactly what happened on February 10th, 1840. And the person who pointed at was John Josiah Perry, who later on, uh, in the latter years of his life, uh, was a very active member of the social Oxford Bears group and went on all these picnics and so on and so forth, and even claimed, as a matter of fact, that he himself was the originator of the term Oxford bear. Uh, but I don't think it's true. I think he may have been the person behind the fact that the newspapers all of a sudden all over the state were talking about the Oxford Bear, but it's pretty unlikely that Perry himself invented the term since it, it obviously had a, a, a kind of an evolutionary origin, I believe, uh, and 
he was simply the recipient of, of one of the many insults leveled at, at Oxford Bears. Mm -hmm. Ten years later in Bangor, uh, March 4, 1851, which was the, let's see, 51, 50, the 34th, 05, 34, how does that work? Somebody do the math. Uh, it was an anniversary of the formation of Oxford County, uh, but an odd year, not the 50th or 25th or whatever. But at any rate, for some reason, a bunch of gentlemen in Bangor decided that they would have a grand meeting of the Oxford Bears in Bangor. They advertised it all over the state. Uh, Elijah Hamlin was the organizer of it, and at that time, Elijah Hamlin was the president of the largest bank in Bangor. He had made lots of money uh, buying and selling land. His brother was a very active politician named Hannibal. Uh, Elijah was a Whig, uh, staunch and uh, unswerving. His brother at that time was a Democrat, just as staunch, just as unswerving. Uh, it must have been interesting at uh, Thanksgiving time when they sat across each other from the table. But Elijah Hamlin decided, along with a lot of other fellow uh, ex-Oxford County folk who were then living in Bangor, and there were quite a number of them actually. There were Prentices, and there were uh, Livermores, and there were Washburns, and there were Hamlins, and so on and so forth. Uh, they decided they would have a grand party. Uh, they would call it the uh, Reunion of the Oxford Bears. They would hold it at the Bangor House, the largest hotel in the city. Uh, they had, according to newspaper uh, reports, 200 people showed up. Uh, Oxford Bears, reporters, uh, honored guests, so on and so forth. They had a grand time, they had lots of toasts. Uh, the meeting was reported in papers throughout the state. Uh, it was clearly a, a grand social event, and it was a, essentially apolitical. It was simply a bunch of guys, and there were guys, the ladies weren't invited. Uh, however, they did write letters in, and the letters were read, and did appear in the paper, so the women did have some input into the party, but it was a male thing at that time. Uh, they had a grand good time, and they pledged that they would re they would do this every year, and so on. They had, uh, uh, according to the newspaper accounts, they had large banquet tables with the Oxford Bear on one end and the Penobscot Moose on the other end, and they had toasts to Oxford and toasts to the mothers of Oxford and the grandmothers of Oxford and the Revolutionary War veterans and Levi Hubbard and so on and so forth, on and on and on into tonight. It was a wonderful time. Uh, however, the Oxford Bears, although they wanted to meet, I guess, again in 1850, they didn't do it. Um, and in fact, they didn't meet again until 1882, uh, when J.J. Perry uh, and some of the same people, George Emery uh, was another. Emery had two sisters who married uh, Hannibal Hamlin, which was quite a feat. Uh, they were, somebody was a joint, a, a dual brother-in-law, I don't know what you call that, a brother-in-law-in-law? I don't know. Uh, at any rate, uh, George Emery had been invited in 1881 out to Chicago. Uh, Charles, uh, who, who's the fellow who built the carriages down here in, uh, in Woodstock? Kimball. Charles J. Kimball, who had become a huge carriage maker in the United States, the General Motors carriage maker of the time, and moved to Chicago. It started out in Woodstock, moved to Bridgeton, then Norway, then Boston, then eventually Chicago, and had a carriage factory which was humongous, and, and, and he made carriages for the royalty of Europe and so on. He was a very wealthy and successful man. His brother, uh, also was wealthy, worked for the Pullman Company from day one and made a fortune in railroads. Uh, at any rate, Kimball decided that he was out in Chicago and he was kind of lonely out there, so he would have, and he, re he recollected as a matter of fact, he was invited to the original uh, Bears Convention in Bangor, and he wasn't able to go at that time. He was a young man in uh, Norway, and, the, Nor and the, the Oxford paper actually has a reference to his having been invited but not having been able to attend. So he's out in Chicago in 1881. He decides that he's going to have a reunion of folks from Maine. He hires a few train cars to come from Boston out to Chicago to bring all of his buddies from Oxford County and the rest of Maine. Hannibal Hamlin's on the train. Hannibal Hamlin's brother-in-law, George Emery's on the train. They go out to Chicago and have a wonderful time. And apparently, the Sons of Maine and Chicago, as it's called, as an organization, uh, met for at least two years. And I don't know, may have met after that. But in 1881 and in 1882, they had meetings. When George Emery came back to Portland, he was a lawyer at the time, I guess he decided that, that was just grand fun, so why not do it here in Maine? So the next year, 1882, Emery organized the meeting of the Oxford Bears, the sons and daughters of Oxford, he called it, and they invited the ladies this time as well as the children, to have a grand uh, feast at a hotel in Portland. A couple of hundred people showed up, they had a grand time, it was wonderful, 
Uh, they did that for three or four years in a row. The featured speakers were Hannibal Hamlin one year, John D. Long another year, who was the, the ex-governor of Massachusetts and a very successful man, well, probably at that time one of the most famous sons of Maine that there was, uh, from Buckfield. Uh, so they had a wonderful time in Portland in 1882 and 3 and 4, and then they decided that uh, why not go back to Oxford County itself, where the sons and daughters of Oxford, let's go to Oxford. So in 1886, they took the train up to Freiburg, several hundred of them. They were met at the station by a band. They were marched down to the Oxford Inn. Uh, Charles Lampson, the well-known photographer from Portland at the time, came up on the train to take pictures of them. One thing I really need to find is a is one of those pictures, because he took a picture of 150 Oxford Bears on the steps of the Oxford Inn. I'm sure that at least 100 of those folks uh, bought that picture from him back in Portland. Maybe only 50, maybe only 25, but they're out there someplace and somebody's at it. Oxford Bears on the steps of the Oxford Inn. And there's a sign, the newspaper description says, there's a sign that says, Welcome Oxford Bears. So if you can find that photograph, please, please let me know. Uh, they had a grand time in Freiburg. The next year they went to Norway. I already described what happened in Norway. They had another grand time in Norway. Uh, in 1888, however, they, they had planned to go out to one of the islands in Casco Bay, and it got put off and got put off again, and there were notices in the Portland paper that it was postponed for some reason or another. Finally, it didn't happen. And in 1889, then they decided to come back to Oxford County. They took the train up to Canton, uh, to the Lakeside Grove on Lake Anasaguntacook. Uh, they stopped there at the Grove, and then another train went up a little further so they could look at the big paper mills up at uh, Kilbertville, which is going to be a big, big thrill for some of the people in Portland. They had another good time. Uh, Georgie Emery was there again, and he put on a sideshow uh, where he had a, a booth with a curtain on the front, and uh, he professed to be taken over by the spirit of Artemis Ward, and he spoke to the crowd uh, as a as a medium. Uh, and the, the the entire speech is reproduced in the Portland paper, and it's really quite a lot of fun uh, to read. But they, so they had another wonderful time. They went back to Portland, and uh, by this time, 1889, a lot of these fellows who actually started out at the meeting in 1851 are getting along in years, uh, and there are no more meetings after 1889. The secretary treasurer of the group was uh, Albert Burbank of Bethel, uh, longtime uh, trustee of the Bethel of the uh, Gould Academy, uh, but a merchant in Portland for most of these years. Uh, and the last entries in the scrapbook that he kept, which is at the Maine Historical Society today, are the records of his having written a check for the, the remaining funds of the club, $15, I think it was, to the sanitarium in Hebron. They decided they would give it to an Oxford County institution. And that was the, that was the official end of the Oxford Bears Club. Uh, but between the origin of the Oxford Bears as a political, uh, a, a highly charged political movement, uh, Jacksonian, anti-Whig, so on and so forth, through this wonderful social thing that happened in the 1880s, there are innumerable instances of the Oxford Bears being used for all kinds of purposes here in Oxford County and elsewhere as well. I brought some of them here, they're on the table. Uh, for example, there's the, uh, let's see, here is, uh, I'm gonna start a little earlier. Uh, on this piece of paper, I've just, this is just sort of cut and paste. Most of these things are in newspapers. It's very hard to find tangible evidences of the Oxford Bears. Randy actually has one of the very few three-dimensional objects that says Oxford Bears on it. It's, it's here in the display case. Terrific. It's his great-grandfather's Knights of Pythias badge, and his grandfather, his great-grandfather belonged to the Oxford Bears Lodge of the KFP over in Mason. Uh, and the actually, as far as I can tell, the, Ox, the passing of the Oxford Bears Lodge of the KFP in Mason, uh, in Hanover. Hanover, excuse me, in Hanover, was actually the last official existence and disappearance of anything with the name Oxford Bear on it. So when they disbanded over there and sold the building, that was the absolute end of the Oxford Bear. But even at that time, in the 60s, Oxford Bears was, were not current in the county. Uh, not current enough so that I know many, many people who lived here in the 60s who don't really have no clue at all about the Oxford Bears. It was really about the 30s that they finally passed away. Up until 1928 or 29, the, uh, uh, the, the Democrat in uh, Oxford, the local column where all the towns would send in, you know, the Bethel and, you know, East Andover and so on, all these kinds of places, little, little columns, dozens and dozens of them. The title of that was the Bear Brigade. Uh, and the paper would talk about the Oxford Bears and so on uh, quite often. When that, when that local heading disappeared, a couple of years later, Donald Partridge
Lethbridge in Norway ran for Congress as the Oxford Bear. Uh, I have a picture here. I've talked to his granddaughter who says that at their camp, at their summer camp, they have, uh, they actually have this uh, in the camp. This is a, uh, is a bear, Partridge for Congress, uh, sitting up on a boulder. Uh, the little headline here, this is in 1930, uh, Norway paper, says the Partridge mascot, the Oxford bear standing boldly against the skyline was a conspicuous landmark during the state campaign which elected Donald E. Partridge of Norway, the Republican congressman from the 2nd District to Congress. So he won his race as the Oxford bear. The really interesting thing, uh, I think, about this is that uh, 1930, there was also a census. 1930, Maine lost the House seat. The House seat that it lost was the Oxford one. <laughs> they decided that Oxford really, I guess, didn't matter that much anymore, so they, they uh, apportioned us out of uh, essentially having a seat that we could call our own, at least at this time. Uh, so with the uh, passing of Donald Partridge, that's the last political appearance of either the Partridge, I guess, or the Bear, uh, both. Uh, also on here are some things from Portland papers. Uh, here's the 1851 notice for the Festival of the Oxford Bears in Bangor. Uh, here's a Buckfield, Maine uh, trademark of a, of a company over there. Uh, here's somebody after the Civil War. Ho, Oxford Bears. Somebody trying to get together a reunion of some Civil War vests. Uh, this this uh, image here, which is very similar to the image we're using for the Bicentennial, appears here. This is on the back of a uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, brochure from, as far as I can figure, the early 40s, I think. So it's still common enough to appear here, uh, but the words don't show up in the paper anymore. Here's a check from Oxford County with, this is really nice, has a little bear in the corner, uh, blank checks we found in the basement. Here's the Rumford Bank and Trust Company with the same circular image with the funny little Oxford bear looking like a something other than a bear. Uh, here's the uh, uh, the Maine State Convention of the YMCA, and these are three pictures are all the same. I was going to cut them out. Uh, this is the Oxford County delegation, and if you look very carefully over the doorway, it says Oxford, and there's a little bear and his little oval circle here. Uh, and let's see, here is uh, these three items are from the Oxford Bear Fruit Growers Association. Uh, that was uh, uh, the Conan brothers, the, I think there were seven Conan brothers in Hebron and Buckfield, all uh, farmers and fruit growers and so on, decided that uh, if they wanted to sell their fruit, they had to have a brand uh, because everybody's selling apples. So how are you going to make your apples stand up? So they, they really invented this Oxford Bears brand uh, I think that the term was just a handy one for them, but they, they developed this notion that if they had an association and everybody in the association would pledge to carefully grade their apples, to separate out the best ones, they would call them Oxford Bears. They had another, a second grade that they had a different name for and so on. And they actually developed quite a reputation for reliability, uh, so much so that they began selling apples overseas and uh, through most of their history, uh, and they were around from about eight, uh, 1915 to 1932 or so. They actually sold more apples overseas than they did in the United States because they were close to the market. Uh, and also, they were extremely reliable. The, the seven, you didn't mess with the seven Conan brothers or their spouses, as I understand it. They ran a tight ship. However, not so tight that the company didn't go under when uh, one of the Conan brothers, as I understand it, from a reliable descendant of one of these Conans, whose name I will not mention here, or we don't want to have it on tape either. Uh, but this uh, person has let me know in confidence that uh, one of these Conan brothers ran off with the till and the singing instructor from the Unitarian Church, and they went west and were not seen again. Uh, and the company, it was also a bad winter that year and so on, so the Oxford Bears. Fruit Growing Company passed away. This is the Paris uh, yearbook. Here's a little cute little Oxford Bear here. It says, Oxford Bears who take the Oxford de Democrat enjoy the fruits of the season and also the local news. Uh, there was a debate club here in uh, uh, Bethel in the 1850s, I believe. Uh, it was during uh, N.T. True's, he was involved in it somehow. It was called the Oxford Bear Debating Society. There was a debating society in, uh, down in the town of Oxford that J.J. Perry was involved in. This was called the Oxford Bear Debating Society. Uh, there were Oxford Bear teams. Uh, there was, uh, I'll just read you this one brief thing because I think it's, uh, I think it's fun. Uh, this is from uh, a time when the, uh, oh, did I not copy it? In that case, I can't read it. Oh, here it is. Uh, this is from a time when the Norway baseball team, known, of course, as the Panasawasis, uh, managed to defeat Bowden to win the gold ball, or was it a silver ball? It was a ball, a commemorative ball. 
uh, that was given to the best, best baseball team in the state of Maine uh, shortly after the Civil, Civil War in the 1860s when baseball really, and, and all this sort of club stuff became very popular. Uh, the Penasawasis uh, managed to beat Bowden. It was a big surprise because everybody thought that Bowden was going to win. Uh, but these fellows from, uh, uh, from Norway, Paris, Hebron uh, went down to Bowden and they actually won the game. Uh, the uh, Brunswick fellows apparently weren't ready for them. And the Brunswick Telegraph, this article was a silver ball, uh, the Brunswick Telegraph reports as follows. The story runs that during the national game in the Classic Shades Saturday, the Oxford Bears, see now the team was actually known as the Penasawasis, so the fact that the Brunswick people would call them the Oxford Bears, even though their name was the Penasawasis, I think <laughs> tells you how prevalent the Oxford Bears were. The story runs that during the national game in the Classic Shades Saturday, the Oxford Bears with their eight pound bat struck the ball so high in the air that to the best of knowledge and belief of the college boys, it has not come down yet. There is no well-authenticated record that the Brunswick girls caught the sturdy Oxford Bears in their arms after the victory of Saturday, but as the matter stands, this duty devolves upon the corn-fed duties of old Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of stuff was going on all over the place. There was grand fun. Uh, why did it happen? Well, I think part of the reason was because counties at the time could have an identity. I don't think that sort of thing could happen again. I can't imagine, you know, the Kennebec, whatever is. Uh, having, <laughs> developing this kind of a history. Uh, I think it happened because it was a, it was a period of time uh, when uh, clubs were being formed, uh, all kinds of men's clubs, women's clubs, whist clubs, sports clubs, picnicking, you know, all this sort of going on vacations and holidays was starting and, you know, there were reasons to get out and do things. It was just another good excuse to get this sort of thing done. Uh, I think another reason it may have happened was because the people up here in Oxford County really had a kind of a personality which they were happy with and they were happy to project to their uh, usual cousins or brothers or sisters who lived just down the road in Portland. There was a lot of back and forth between the people up here and the people down there and I think it was a lot of it was good natured. Uh, but it was easy to, it was, it was a clear distinct image to purvey. Uh, I, it, I don't think it can happen again. I think that after the bicentennial this year and after the Oxford Bear has his little airing, we got him on a hibernation and walk him around and let people look at him and so on. My suspicion is he'll turn around and go back into hibernation and, uh, and maybe uh, some researcher another hundred years from now will have just as much fun as I did uh, finding him out and, uh, and discovering what he's all about and uh, describing it to audiences like this one. So thanks a lot for inviting me here. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any Oxford Bears questions? Somebody has, there's a badge, there are badges someplace. I need one. I just need to look at one just to see it. So. <laughs> Would you want to take a little bit more about the bicentennial? Sure, I'd be happy to. I brought up, uh, I, I emailed up to Randy a schedule, uh, and he's, he's printed it here. I brought up to Stan another couple of, uh, there, yeah, of larger schedules uh, for the events on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You're laughing at me. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of polio reenactments. We'll be there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, on Sunday, there's going to be a very nice little ceremony if you could make it. I, I doubt very many people will be there, maybe just a handful, but I plan to be there. Uh, the, re the, the militia companies of the reenactment group are going down to the old Pioneer Cemetery and are going to have a little memorial service for Lemuel uh, Jackson Jr., the first settler of Paris. Uh, that's going to be very nice. They'll shoot the little that? Uh, that's going to be at nine, from the start at 9.15, and they'll march, we'll start on the green. Sunday morning? Sunday morning. Yep, they'll march down to the cemetery, which is just a little ways, uh, you know, a few hundred yards out of town. I think that's going to be really nice. So if you can be there and take a picture of that, I think you'll, you'll cherish it for a long time. On Friday, the reenactors are coming to set up, and uh, there's a walking tour of Paris uh, Hill, uh, run by Ben B. Conant, who knows just about all there is to know about Paris Hill, and a, will be a grand tour guide. I wouldn't miss it. I'm going to be there. <laughs> Following that, uh, I'm going to give a very brief talk, maybe for just 20 minutes, on a rough overview of the history of the county, for the sake primarily the reenactors who are all from, from away. Uh, and then uh, H. Draper Hunt, uh, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Southern Maine, uh, will talk about Hamlin, uh, Lincoln, and the Civil War Vice Presidency. That will be at 7 o'clock. Uh, then on Saturday, uh, there's a grand celebration with all the historical societies, or most of them, having displays uh, from about, if you're going to be there just for a couple hours, you should want to be there between about 10 and 12 for the parade. Uh, the horses that have been traveling all over Oxford County and came through Bethel a couple of weeks ago uh, have finished their circuit, and they're going to come from the, from the courthouse up to Paris Hill. 
uh, and they're going to complete handing the document that's been carried now all the way from Boston uh, to the county commissioners. Uh, they're the band, the Mahusik band, will provide music. We've got another couple of bands. Uh, let's see, we'll have other talks in the afternoon. Uh, Earl Shuttleworth, Main State Historian, will talk, and uh, Dr. Martha McNamara will talk about the courthouses of uh, early Maine and Massachusetts. And Representative Herb Adams is on the agenda to talk about three important naturalists that we really need to hear about. Uh, Charles O. Whitman of Woodstock, Addison Barrow of Greenwood, and uh, Ned Morris of almost every place, including Bethel. <laughs> uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, there will also be rides for kids, and uh, we have uh, Mr. Newcomb coming down from Hamden, who does a Hannibal Hamlin uh, impersonation, and he's bringing his uh, puppet, Abraham Lincoln, for kids. And, and uh, Lincoln and Hamlin apparently will have some things to talk about for the children. Uh, might be fun to see that too. At any rate, all kinds of things going on. We hope uh, you'll be able to come for one or two or three days, or one or two or three hours, or whatever. It's going to be it's going to be great, and you don't have another one for another hundred years, so don't miss it. Any other questions of that, uh, Larry? Thank, thank you, Larry. We appreciate you coming, and stay around for some uh, refreshments. And we'll, we'll go from there. So. Great, thanks. Thank you. Don't forget to look at uh, Randy's badge. It's one of the few real Oxford Bear pieces of memorabilia you might ever see in your life. Thank <laughs> you.